Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we praise You for the excitement in the room. We praise You, Father, for the diligent and dedicated attendance of those here tonight and and in all the weeks past as we've studied through Luke. We're so grateful, Father, that You saw fit to uh, give us an opportunity to finish this book here tonight. And it's, uh, it is the case, Father, that we look to the end of a book as a, a sense of achievement or accomplishment, Father, but really it's just a stopping point along a way that we know continues indefinitely, that we'll never stop studying the, the Word, Father, we'll never stop learning. And so, though we are excited to see the book end, we are also aware, Father, that there is no end, none in this lifetime, Father, but rather a continual call to study. And so we, we ask that tonight would... Uh, both serve the purpose of, of a capstone to our study and our understanding of the gospel. And at the same time, Father, it could be a launch pad so that we could uh, take what we've learned here and just dive in even deeper in your word so that it would continue to do the great work that it does in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the provision we've had in this room over the weeks that we've been in this, uh, been able to meet in this study. Thank you, Father, for the gifts of service and prayer, the gifts, Father, of encouragement and hospitality and the many ways you've called the Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of those gathered so that the body would be blessed. For the faithfulness, Father, you've shown in that, we praise you as well. And as we devote ourselves now to your word, we place it foremost in our minds and in our hearts. We set aside as best we can, Father, the distractions we've brought in as we've come into this room tonight. We set ourselves down at your feet and we submit, Father, to your authority and your word. And we seek, Father, to be obedient and to glorify you in all that we would say and do from what we learned tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, tonight we do reach the culmination of the Gospel of Luke. And of course, with it, we finish our examination of Jesus' ministry during his first arrival on earth. And, and like any end, it's an opportunity for a moment of reflection, thinking back a little over what we've studied. Jesus' is teaching, for all that we would remember of it, for all that people talk about it, would have no meaning for us today, or for anyone for that matter, had it not been mirrored by his sinless life. But then again, his sinless life would have had absolutely no significance for it had it not been met at the end with the unjustified death that he had on the cross. And likewise, that death would have had no power for us today had it not been followed by a glorious resurrection and ascension. And so tonight, as we end the book of Luke, I'd like to reflect just a moment on the fact that we are now looking at his departure from earth, his ascension, but it, it only lasts for a time, this time that we now have even in this moment awaiting his return. It is just a, a, an interlude until the real event of his return. So what we're studying tonight is the last step in preparation for an eventual return, which is now our focus as a Christian today. Last week when we studied the beginning of chapter 24, we witnessed an empty tomb. The gospel as it ends tonight, as we finish it, as we study out the last events of his days on earth, its effect on our life should be none other than to point us toward the moment we see him come back again. You know, Hollywood really has this pattern down to a T, to an art. They make tons of money perfecting this this technique of, at the end of a movie, the scene leaves you with a very clear, obvious expectation that part two will be out next summer. And we'll pick up right where this one left off. And I can see it coming in my mind and I'm already anticipating it before I leave the theater. Christians should have that same anticipation, that same uh, perspective on their Lord's return, even as we study the verses tonight. Perhaps give yourself a chance to see it in that way. As the end of this movie may come, the next one is only set to begin. And the thrill of this next one is you don't know when. It's not coming attractions, it's any moment. That's the attitude Christians are to take away from what they learn in the Gospel tonight. We'll begin where we left off, of course. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. As Jesus, we know, has set out for the Galilee and the disciples are wondering about the events they've witnessed. Verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. We'll stop there. We're going to go through the events of this chapter in segments, as I normally do. 
But there's really two scenes present in the end of chapter 24. And we open with the first. Among the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is by far the most detailed account of Jesus' appearance outside of Jerusalem. John's Gospel, you may know, gives a bit more detail about his appearances within Jerusalem to the disciples. John also tells, by the way, of a third appearance in the Galilee region itself, which is not covered in the Synoptic Gospels at all. This story begins with two men, we're told, walking along a road that leads out of Jerusalem toward a small town called Emmaus. And Emmaus, as we said, as the Gospel it says, is about seven miles northwest of Jerusalem. We can only assume that their journey here is really a byproduct of the Passover. Remember we said that there are three festivals every year that the law required Jews, male Jews, to attend in person in the city of Jerusalem, the Passover being one of those. The Passover now having been complete, these men are obviously on their way back, leaving the city to return to their home. And we're told that as they walk, they talk about the things that had taken place in Jerusalem that week. So it's obvious enough, as we start tonight, that the ministry that Jesus brought into the city and the effect he had while he was in the city had a, was known to every man, had widespread impact in the city. The, the events, though they may not have been widely understood in all cases, they were certainly noticed. And it had become the talk of the town. Not just his death, of course. I would expect that the real news here was all the wild rumors now that were running around the city in the last day of the fact that his body was missing from the tomb that the tomb had been opened and his body was missing, and then added to that these crazy accounts, these crazy witnesses, these women who said, he's not just missing, he's alive. Impossible things, really, when you think about it. In fact, it's kind of the stuff of National Enquirer, and probably had a very similar effect on the people in that city. You know, these scandalous, amazing stories that quickly circulated. And as they walk, amazingly, we're told, Jesus approaches. Now, he joins them, we're told, in their walk on this road to Emmaus, and that wasn't the least bit unusual. There was absolutely nothing unusual about them seeing a stranger join them in this way. Travel in this day, in in the land of Judea, was done largely on foot, and it was always along uh, well-marked Roman roads, generally very well-kept Roman roads for that matter, because thieves were common, lawbreakers were common, and you would suffer at their hands if you traveled at night, or if you traveled alone. So a single solitary traveler like Jesus would often attach himself to another band of travelers for the sake of safety in numbers. So it's quite expected that two men walking would have seen a third one join them. That wouldn't have caused them to be alarmed or at all uh, surprised. Now, since Jesus is walking in the same direction as them, I can only assume as well that they would have believed he was leaving Jerusalem, much like they did, and probably for the same reason. He had gone in to attend the Passover. Now he was leaving. That was a safe assumption. And their comments to him as we look at the dialogue reinforces that assumption in my mind. The Scripture tells us these men, as they see him approach and as he joins them in this walk, they are prevented, we're told, from knowing and recognizing who Jesus was. Isn't that fascinating? They were prevented. The phrase in Greek here literally means something took away their eyes' ability to be aware of what they saw. It's it's a sort of blindness implied, but not in a literal sense, sort of in a selective sense. Their eyes lost, they were prevented from having the ability to see something that was before them. That being, of course, the identity of Jesus. They saw him as a man, but not as the man he was. I think this is similar in some respects maybe to that invisible force that prevents husbands from noticing their wife's new hairstyle uh, on occasion. Or um, children from noticing the clothes that have been laying on their floor for the last two days. It's the same basic principle, I think, at work. They see Jesus, they speak with Jesus, and yet they can't recognize who He truly is. They know Him, but they don't know Him. They hear Him, but they don't hear Him. It's an interesting dilemma, and it's it's a pattern I want you to hold on to because it's going to repeat itself and grow as we move through this chapter. What kind of cause do you attribute this strange blindness to? I mean, it's an active verb in the sense of how the Greek phrases it. It's not as though they just didn't get it. It is very active. Something stopped them from getting it. So, to whom or to what do we attribute this to? Well, we know the answer, right? The answer clearly is God Himself, principally through His Holy Spirit. So, God, we're told, 
and it, or it's clearly implied, would not allow these men to know who Jesus was in that moment, for he had better things planned. Luke 24, 17. And he said to them, What are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. Before we go any further into this dialogue, I, I, I want to pause here just for the comic effect that I feel I, I see in the text here. Because imagine these men. I want you to put yourself, as, as we often do, in the moment a little bit, in your mind's eye. You have these men walking down the road. And, and as I imagine it, they're abreast, three abreast. And as I prefer to imagine it, I put Jesus in the middle. Pick your own approach. But there's a sense here in my mind that Jesus is between them, listening to the conversation as they walk abreast. And you know, if you walk that way, you're not so much looking at one another. You're really just looking ahead as you talk. And at first, Jesus doesn't say much. He's joined them, but he's listening more than talking. And the men are talking excitedly, as the Scripture seems to suggest, back and forth about all they saw in Jerusalem. And you can imagine some of the details in that conversation about you know, talking about who said what or how did it happen or perhaps what was to be, you know, uh, what would explain some of the events and who were those Jewish leaders who put him to death, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just talking back and forth. And then finally, after a while, Jesus speaks up and his first comments are to ask, what are you talking about? And basically, Jesus here is acting as though he had not heard anything about this prophet, this man who had just been put to death in the city, who had been tried beforehand, who had come into the temple early in the week and been teaching with so much power. He, he isn't lying. I don't want to leave you with that impression. He just doesn't discuss the details. He asks the question, tell me about what you're talking about. Tell me about the meaning of what you're talking about. Think of it more as a test, as the kind of test you might apply to someone who is trying to demonstrate a knowledge in a subject and you want them to demonstrate to your satisfaction that they really understand what they're talking about. It's in that sense that he prompts them with this question. When he speaks these words, and this is where I sense a bit of comic, a comical moment, the scripture says clearly, the men literally stop, which implies to me that Jesus kept walking for another step or two. He's not necessarily expecting them to stop. So there's a sense of incredulity from, from them. They see this, or they hear this question. They stop in their tracks. Jesus walks forward a few more steps, perhaps, and maybe turns around to look at them. And when he sees their face, he sees this sadness, we're told, a sort of frozen expression, a, a sort of downward countenance based on his question. They're, they're stunned. They're stunned literally to find someone leaving the city of Jerusalem who doesn't know of these, or appears to not know, of these extraordinary events that they've just been discussing. And their sadness is a sadness from any Jew who would think that there could be another Jew who missed the significance of a prophet having visited his people. Remember, this is roughly 400 years since the last prophet was known to have visited Israel from God, Malachi. And in those 400 years, we call it the intertestamentary period, a period between the Testaments, the Old and the New, when God was silent to his people and that there was no prophet sent to the nation of Israel. And as we'll see here in a minute, when they describe what they are talking about, they'll call Jesus a prophet. To them, the Jewish nation has received a new prophet from God and all the events that surrounded that prophet were remarkable. And here's a Jew, presumably, who has gone into the city to worship in the temple as part of the Passover, presumably, and yet he knows nothing of this great prophet. That's a sadness to a Jew who holds great regard for God's word and for the men who bring it. And in that they have this sad response. Now look at what they say to him after that initial shock. In verse 18, one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem, unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about the Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. They, when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. So I read it as a sort of rapid reaccounting of the events with an excited, almost exasperated tone 
mixture of, of, of wanting to communicate the significance, but at the same time feeling some frustration, perhaps, at the fact that they even have to go through this explanation, that someone leaving Jerusalem wouldn't have heard all this already. Cleopas begins with that mocking question of Jesus, and you can sense the mocking nature of it even as you read it. He says, are you the only one who doesn't know these things? It's a lot like saying, what rock did you crawl out from under? It's that you know, way of saying, you, you, you're dumb to not have known these things. How could it possibly be that somebody in the city of Jerusalem for the last week, because remember the festival they came to attend was a week-long event. You've been in the city a whole week and you don't know the story? This is a pretty small town, frankly. It wouldn't have been very easy for someone to have avoided the events if they had tried. The dialogue here makes absolutely clear how all-encompassing Jesus' death had become for that city. There wasn't anyone in that city who could have been oblivious to what happened. And in response to that question, Jesus and I find this quite interesting, he continues to bait them a little bit here. He continues to bait them into telling him what they believe happened. And that's the test implicit in this conversation. Why is he engaging in this conversation? What's his specific purpose? He's not just having fun at the expense of these two guys walking to Emmaus. It's not like he's bored. This isn't just passing the time. There's a very good purpose in this. And obviously it's purpose in being recorded in the Gospel itself suggests that that there's a meaningful reason for why the conversation had to take place. He's working toward a point. And it's a point which Luke himself is intent to capture and reinforce, and it becomes the last point of his Gospel. This point that we're now going to examine as Jesus teaches it takes us all the way to the end of the Gospel. He asks them, give me the details. What do you think you saw? And they begin by saying, these were the events of a man named Jesus of Nazareth the mighty prophet who impressed the peoples. Now, their description is true enough, I mean, at least in the sense that Jesus was a prophet during his time here on earth. If you know your scriptures reasonably well, you may know that Jesus has three roles as God has provided for him in his ministry to men. He is a prophet, and in the time that he walked the earth and spoke, and the words that he spoke were recorded by men to be used later in the book as we see it today in the Bible, he gave us a prophetic word the Word of God. And in that way, he became a prophet. And now in his position, at the right hand of the Father, having ascended and interceding for the saints, he is our high priest. So he is not only prophet, but he is also priest to you and I who believe, interceding for the needs of the saints. Ultimately, upon his return, he will assume the throne of David, as God has promised, and rule the earth from Jerusalem. And in that role, he becomes our king. So you often hear him described as prophet, priest, and king. And it describes the three facets of his ministry, the three roles he plays throughout the ages in his ministry to men and to earth. So in this moment, as they say he is a prophet, well, they're absolutely true. And did he perform mighty deeds? Well, certainly he did. And he taught with mighty words. All of those statements they make are absolutely true. The problem with their response, of course, is that they don't go far enough. The problem is not in what they said, it's in what they didn't say. Jesus was not merely a prophet. He was also the Messiah. He was God in the flesh. And their statements make clear that though they give, they give him plenty of respect and plenty of admiration, they're even willing to acknowledge that Jesus came with God's power. They credit him as a prophet, of course. They still fall short at this moment in their understanding of who Jesus truly was. And I find it particularly interesting that they are currently being prevented, we're told, from recognizing Jesus, even as he stands in their midst. So here are men who, by their own confession, have failed to grasp the meaningfulness of who Jesus was and what he did. They're standing in his very midst now, the risen Lord standing with them, and yet God is still active, preventing them, we're told, from recognizing who he is, at least for the moment. Which would cause me to conclude, and I hope you as well, that the fact that they haven't recognized him up to this moment is not chance. That it were the case that if God had intended for them to understand who he was, then he wouldn't be preventing them from seeing it even in this moment. That there is an intentional withholding of this recognition, at least for the time being, as part of God's plan for these men. Which means his purpose in doing so is ultimately going to be consummated by how he brings them into the story. How he eventually gives them the understanding that they currently lack. There's some greater purpose in how God is orchestrating these details, which then means it is incumbent upon us to try to understand that purpose. 
Because God does nothing for chance. He does nothing capriciously. He does it all for a purpose. We are then required to understand that purpose. In the stories we've read it, they then go on to tell how the chief priests were responsible for Jesus' death. We're only a few days here following Jesus' death, and already the common man's understanding of the events that they witnessed in Jerusalem includes this awareness that the Jewish leaders were responsible for Jesus' death. Don't let anyone tell you that it came decades or centuries later that men began to turn against the Jewish people, if it, as it were, in some sort of anti-Semitic slur and put the, blood, the death of Jesus on the shoulders of the Jewish leaders as if you were attacking the Jewish people for doing so. Number one, it is true from Scripture that almost immediately, if not immediately, the crowds of the city understood who was to be blamed for the death of the Lord. Secondly, we already know, and we've studied this back going into the earlier chapters of Luke, that though the Jewish leaders turned against Jesus and were the instrument by which he was put to death, it is not to say that God did not intend for it to happen in that way, and it can never be an excuse for anti-Semitic belief. So it is not correct to then turn that into a basis for anti-Semitism. But it is still the case that the Jewish leaders of that day were the individuals who orchestrated the events that led to Jesus' death. That is fact alone out of Scripture, and you see it clearly represented here in the way these men describe the events of that city. The early church, by the way, continued to carry that understanding all the way up to and past the point of the first martyrs. If you remember Stephen and the testimony he gives before he's stoned, he credits specifically the death of Jesus to the acts and behaviors of the religious leaders of Jerusalem. He includes that in his testimony. But the men say, finally, at the point now in this discourse, they finally say why they are so sad. We finally understand now their sadness. It wasn't merely that, they, that this, this traveler didn't know who Jesus was. Their sadness was really a reflection of the hope they had for who Jesus would be. We're told that they had hoped Jesus would redeem Israel. And it's interesting that they use the word redeem here. They didn't say, we hoped Jesus would rescue us from the Romans. We hoped that Jesus would free Israel from its oppressor. No, they used the word redeem. Out of Psalms 130, verse 6, I believe this is the intent of their statement, as Psalms 130 reflects it. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with Him is abundant redemption. He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. So the sense of a redeemer to Israel is in the context of redeeming them from their iniquities before God restoring them into a good and, and faithful relationship with the God that they had offended through their sin. That's the sense of it. And in their statement here, they're saying, we had such high hopes for this guy. He, we, we were sure he was the Redeemer. And then he died. And the implication is, therefore, he's not the Redeemer. No Redeemer would die. I mean, the, the end of this can't be a death on the cross. That, that clearly eliminates him from contention for the Redeemer. Wow, it was so close. It looked like it was him. And now we're sad to think that we don't have our Redeemer after all. We thought we had him. You, you might say this is somewhat the way Chicago Cub fans feel every season about this time of year. Now, this year is a little different. They have reason for hope. But most of the time at this time, there, there's really no reason for hope anymore. The season ended somewhere around May for, for the most part. And, and yet, as the season kind of falls apart they're always kind of ready to hope again the next year. You know, there's this seasonal hope that comes around every year. And in the same way, I think, though these men are sad now, it's not the same thing as saying they had given up hope in a Messiah. It is a sadness around the possibility that this man might have been that Messiah and, oh, no, not him after all. Oh, well, maybe it's the next one. Maybe next year, as a Chicago Cubs fan would say. So the men are so close to knowing the truth, and yet so far... They're on the verge, in fact, of missing their Messiah, and yet here he stands in their midst. And yet we know they're being prevented from seeing him for who he really is. Now, they say that besides all this, as they end that discourse, they say it's been three days since he died. This is an interesting phrase. You could look at it a couple of ways. You could, for example, look at it as an emphasis for why they think Jesus should know these facts. I mean, it's been three days. The word's gotten around. You should have known it by now. But I don't think that's what they mean. I don't think that's what they mean at all. I think what they're saying here is that three days had significance for his disciples. 
On more than one occasion, Jesus alluded to something happening after three days. That that after three days he could rebuild the temple. Or that the only sign that would be given to the leaders would be the sign of Jonah. After three days in the fish, he would come out. There's this this expectation based on what Jesus had taught. Not a clear one. Not one that they really understood deeply, maybe. But yet, something was significant about three days. So maybe this fact that three days after he died, there's some reason to, to expect something. And yet... All we got was an empty grave and a missing body and these crazy stories from these women who can't be trusted, of course, to tell us that he's alive again. It's like they get it, but they don't get it. They see it, but they don't see it. They found a a stone rolled away. They found an empty tomb. They found the clothes that he was wrapped in left behind. They hear of angels reporting the missing body and the women saying that he is now alive. But since they haven't seen with their eyes the missing body, they're not willing to believe. Didn't you catch that in the text? They say some of the ones that were with us went, but they didn't see the body. It seems to put a punctuation at the end of the story to say, too bad, not true, what a shame. Why? Because they didn't see a body? The stone is rolled away? The angels are reporting his, his, his resurrection, but you didn't see a body? And that's all it takes for you to doubt? I think it's obvious from their testimony that these were men who were disciples of Jesus and they had been spending time among the disciples, among the apostles. They keep using references here like some of us, some of those who were uh, with us. There's this sense of a larger community of disciples to include the apostles who had gathered together in the city and had been together shortly after the death of Jesus and these two men were one of them or two of them and they have now left that group. But it's also true to think that these men were obviously not prone to logical thinking. Why do I say that? Because if they had been, they wouldn't have been so reluctant to accept the women's testimony. After all, they had remembered something about Jesus' teaching that had told them that the third day would be important in some sense. Then on that third day, they had women who said the tomb was empty, stone moved, missing body, and the only part of that whole story that they received from those women that required any faith at all, the only part that wasn't provable in the moment, was that this missing body was missing because it came back to life and was resurrected. That's the one critical piece that was unprovable, sure enough, But it's the only piece. I mean, the rest of the story is just as amazing. The the stone moved? Who did that? With a Roman guard watching it the whole time? How did that happen? A body just mysteriously disappears? Angels reporting things to the women? I mean, these are women that you know and you trust as fellow disciples of the Lord, and now you think they're crazy? Now you think they can't say anything that makes sense? You know, how much faith do you need? That's the implication of this. They're not thinking logically. If they were willing to accept Jesus... When he raised men like Lazarus, then why are they unreceptive of claims that he could do it for himself? If you think he's Messiah because he performed those kind of miracles, but you doubt that he could do it for himself? The point in all of this, of course, is that these men have not responded in faith to what they've seen. They've seized on any opportunity for doubt to confirm an unbelieving heart, though they were disciples, at least in the sense that they were following Jesus. And then to this, look how Jesus responds. If you think I'm being too harsh on these guys, look where Jesus goes next. Luke 24, verse 25. He said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into His glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning Himself in all the Scriptures. How foolish indeed. These men were. But not just because they refused to accept the testimony of these women. That's not what made them foolish in and of themselves. They're not called foolish because you didn't believe the women. Their foolishness is rooted in their unwillingness to listen to and believe what they had received in God's Word. You know, Moses and all the prophets, as we've studied already, is a phrase that means the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, the Scriptures that had been written and existed at that point. And in particular... And I think this is the focus for the chapter. What they were foolish to not believe is that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because Jesus had been put to death because clearly the Messiah couldn't have his life end in death. And yet the very thing their scriptures taught was that outcome. Not just that there would be a Messiah, but that he would die. And it taught why he would die. It taught that he would be rejected by the very men that they just said rejected him. It taught that he died in a certain way and a certain time. All of that fulfilled. 
They only had to read and believe what was in their word to know who Jesus was. Do you remember a few chapters back in this, in this study of Luke, specifically Luke chapter 16, we saw Jesus teach this story of Lazarus and the rich man. And if you were with me when we taught through that chapter, do you remember the point of that story as Jesus taught it all the way through, how he applied that story to the men who listened to it in that day? And in that story, in Luke chapter 16, the rich man asks for a miracle. He asks that Abraham would send Lazarus back to his brothers. The miracle of a body resurrected and appearing before his brothers. And this resurrected uh, man Lazarus, appearing to the rich man's brothers, he believed would be the thing to convince his brothers to know the truth and avoid hell and therefore not suffer the way he was. That was his request of Abraham. And when he requests that miracle... Abraham answers by saying that even the raising of the dead will not accomplish the purpose that that man intended. Not even the raising of a dead man and his presentation before another man would suffice to produce faith in that man's heart. It will not succeed. It cannot convince men of a truth that their heart is predisposed against because it is not the way by which God has chosen to bring faith into the hearts of men. That power is uniquely reserved for the Word of God. Because God saves by the power of His Word, and if He does it that way, He will rightly receive the glory for that work. That's why He does it that way. If it is seen to be by some other means, then the sinful pride of men will quickly seek a way to claim credit by that means for that work. And we see it every day around us. Men who would say that the saving grace of God can be appropriated through you know, the green prayer cloth that you can order for ten ninety five. Order now, get two, right? Or by a certain series of words or waving of hands or a certain works or whatever the method is we attach, it becomes an opportunity for men's pride to sinfully share in the glory that is rightfully due solely to God for the saving grace that He offers men. That is the problem with any technique that begins to supplant God's Word because God's Word is it. It is the only way. God will not share His glory with men and by vesting the power to know the Lord in His Holy Word, He is ensured that He will rightly receive all that glory. God's one chosen tool to bring men to faith in the Messiah is the Word of God. That is His chosen instrument for producing faith in the heart. And in Jesus' day, the Word of God was the Old Testament as you and I see it today. In our day, of course, it includes the New Testament. It is God's written Word in total. And in those earlier chapters we studied, we saw Jesus blast the Jewish leaders after He taught that story. And He accused them of blinding Israel to the truth. What did He mean by that? He meant, you are the keepers of the teaching of the Word to the nation of Israel, and yet instead of illuminating the Scriptures so as to show them who I am, that they might recognize me upon my arrival, rather than do that, you turned the Word into a yoke of burdens that burdened them and turned them against me so that they could not recognize me in my day. Because you did not explain it properly, you turned it into something evil. And if you had given it the proper due, if you had explained it in its truthful form, it would have illuminated them as to who the Messiah would be and then they would have had eyes to see. So likewise, here now, look at how it's playing out in the lives of these men. Jesus says to these men that by saying, when He says that they're fools, He says they're fools because why? They rely on what they are seeing in order to establish their understanding rather than on relying on God's Word. It's just that simple. Until they see His body, basically, they're not going to believe that Jesus could be the Messiah. And therefore, Jesus says you're slow to believe God's Word. Now, you're Jesus in this moment. Just put yourself in that moment for a second. You're Jesus. You know the whole picture. You know they don't know who you are. You know that they don't understand what they've been taught. And you know that if you were to appear to them right then and there, kind of take the blinds off their eyes, take the scales and just sort of poof and all of a sudden they'd know who you were. Why don't you do that right here? Isn't this the perfect chance? See? Don't you guys get it? It's me. I feel like doing that. I don't know about you. Doesn't that feel sort of satisfying? Kind of throw it in their face a little bit? But he doesn't do that. And not just because it would be mean-spirited. He doesn't show himself to these men. It seems the logical response. I mean, it seems the best way to solve the problem. But he doesn't do it. If he were to have done that, he would have been repeating the error that the rich man made in his request to Abraham, wouldn't he? What did Abraham ask? Well, what what did the rich man ask of Abraham? Send a resurrected man to prove to them what they should know about God. If Jesus' response to their unbelief 
because they didn't pay attention to the Word of God, had been to present to them a resurrected man. It's the same error. And therefore, we can know it would have had the same effect. No faith. Because faith is not based on the appearance of a resurrected man. It's based on the Word of God. No physical manifestation can take the place of the Word of God. Remember, they've already seen the death of Christ. They've already heard the reports of a missing body. They've already heard the first, wit the first person witness accounts of women who said, the angels told us he's been resurrected. I mean, they're this close to getting that resurrected body as it is. Had no effect. But it would have been wrong if God had done that because it would have been placing emphasis on what they saw rather than on what they might believe in faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, right, says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It is by God's desire that faith would be based on those things you cannot see, but rather on a faith in the heart that is unseen. It is a conviction without a proof that you can point to. That's the definition of faith. Romans 8.24 says, For in hope we have been saved. But then Paul says, But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? He defines it as hope cannot be the thing you know tangibly because it's the definition of hope to have something unseen. It's a future expectation. Our faith in Jesus, therefore, is rooted in our trust and our faith in God's Word and in His promises implicit in His Word. Any other basis for faith apart from a trust in God's Word is no faith at all. Merely the appearance of it. What's the response to their lack of belief? Not a physical appearance of Christ before their eyes, an expounding of the Word of God. Jesus gives an exposition of the Word of God that only God could give. Would you like to have been there for that conversation? I know I would have. I'd have, had, I'd, I'd have taken notes, too. I mean, what would it have been like to listen as God explains His Word and reveals what the text says about Jesus and about His coming ministry as it's revealed on every page of the Bible? What would that have been like? Well, let me tell you, you could have exactly that same experience. What most Christians, I think, fail to appreciate is you don't need a resurrected Christ to stand before you to gain the kind of insight that is available for you in the Scriptures because Jesus promised that to those who would become His disciples, God will give His Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is the one who will teach you all things. You have no less God in you than they had God before them. And if you have no less God in you than they had standing before them it is safe to assume that you have no less ability to know the Christ they saw revealed in their Scriptures, revealed in the ones you study. But like these men, we've got to walk with Him. I don't want to draw out the analogy to the point of ridiculousness, but you know, they've accompanied Him for a time now, and He's sharing time with them and in a sort of symbolic sense or spiritual sense. If we're not walking in the sense of accompanying Jesus in our life, making the study of Scripture and our attending to it and our obedience to it, a sort of daily experience, then what do we expect? I mean, really, what kind of response do we expect from a Holy Spirit if our attentiveness to His Scripture is fleeting at best? Or our obedience to it is marginal at best? One of the reasons the ministry that, that I have and that others have with me makes a point to teach God's Word verse by verse is, and, and to do so consistently is our conviction that nothing else takes the place of Scripture in persuading the unbeliever to the truth of the gospel and to prepare the saints for the work of ministry. There is no substitute. There's no number two choice. It's that or nothing. And the conviction of the ministry is because of that truth, there's only one thing to do. Expound the scripture so that those who hear it might be prepared for what God has for them. First in faith, second in works of service. That is the principal purpose of scripture. As we move back further now into this discussion, look what happens next. Verse 28. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going further. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road? while he was explaining the Scriptures to us. And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experience on the road and how he, had, and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. 
And so we're told they continue on that trip, at least for a time. They reach a stopping point, probably near the end of the day. That was the pattern. You walked as far as daylight lets you, or until you reached the next logical stopping point before night. Jesus, as they approach the city, though, leaves the impression he's going to keep going. Now, why would he do that? Again, I think there's a test implicit in this. What is their response going to be to him, having had the scriptures explained concerning the Christ? The point he's doing here, again, the point in all this is to bait them once more, it seems. It's as almost as though he's waiting for that invitation. He's waiting for that response. He's looking for them to respond back to him in light of what they have heard now out of the Scripture. And they do so, urging him to stay, and so he agrees. And at the table we hear he reclines, he breaks bread, he blesses it, he hands it out. And at that moment they recognize him. Now what caused the recognition? Some might think it was merely this situation where he's breaking the bread and perhaps in the moment as he did that, it sort of evoked the memory of what he did at the Last Supper. Sort of a, oh, I've seen this before, deja vu. And oh, it's Jesus. But the text doesn't give us any option to consider that because first of all, their eyes were opened, as we understand it in the Greek text, from some outside source. The sense of the verb is some external actor on the body. Secondly, these men weren't at the Last Supper. There's no memory to evoke. They didn't see the Last Supper, so they have no comparison to make here between this moment and the previous one. Thirdly, sitting down, breaking bread, blessing it, and eating it was hardly a unique event in the life of a Jew. That pretty much opened every meal. So there's nothing about the meal, there's nothing about the events that would have triggered some sudden insight. It is the case that an external actor, we know that now to be God, of course, acted on the heart and minds of these individuals so that in the right moment, according to God's will, they would know who this man was. And in that moment, the recognition came. So what's happened here? I mean, what's the point, maybe, in how this has transpired? Well, two men who had seen and known Jesus were prevented from knowing who he was until they had heard the truth of Jesus according to the Scriptures. And once they had heard these things, it had an immediate effect on their heart. They came to a new understanding. They they came to a new spiritual place. Look at verse 32. When did the experience of that new understanding or that new revelation take place? Did it take place at the dinner table? Did it take place at the appearing of his physical body before them? Was it at the moment they saw him breaking bread and then suddenly recognized who he was, that the insight came, that this new spiritual dimension arrived? No. No. It's the burning of the heart. It's at the moment on the road as they are listening to the Scripture in verse 32. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us? And John Wesley, who you may know from early American colonial times and into the 19th century, he was a famous preacher. John Wesley says he remembers distinctly his conversion moment. That there was a noticeable warmth present in his heart, in his chest area, as he was hearing the Word of God expounded such that it led him to faith. Now, that's not to present... To, to suggest that everyone should experience exactly that outcome. No, that's not a rule by any stretch. But in his mind, he remembered that moment in that way and it seemed to connect for him to this story. That there was this sense that his body, his spiritual nature changed as a function of that knowing coming out of the Word of God and it, it had that effect on him. Here you see the men confessing a very similar kind of reaction. Didn't you feel that when we were listening to the Scriptures being expounded? When did they experience belief in their heart? On the road. So what brought about their faith? The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God, we're told in Romans. The seed is the Word of God. And where it lands, it will bring new life. And 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul says, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the Word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the Word of men, but for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. It is the instrument by which God brings faith to men. And then upon their recognition of who he was physically, he vanishes. Which tells us, among other things, that in his resurrected form, Jesus has the ability to do supernatural things. No different, for that matter, than he did in his first form, as he raised people from the dead and walked on water. And then these men were told, run back to confirm that Jesus has risen. And they're so excited, we're told they run back immediately, which is significant because it suggests a very long all-night trek, which would have been a dangerous thing to do, and no man normally would have done that. It's a sign of how urgently they felt they needed to return and testify to what they had heard. And they testify, we're told, to the eleven. 
of all that had happened. Now here's the, another, here's the next phase of this teaching, and here's the next test question. And if we see these first two men, having known Jesus and been there His disciple and been with Him in all that time, and yet not having come to faith until such time as the Word of God is expounded to them, then what reaction would you expect now of the eleven? These are the eleven apostles. These are the paragons of the church. These are the first leaders. They are now about to receive the testimony of these two men, combined with the earlier testimony of the women. What reaction should we expect from them? Verse 36. While they were telling these things, he himself, this is Jesus, of course, of course, stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his feet and his, his hands and his feet, while they still could not believe, uh, could, while they still could not believe it, because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, "Have you anything here to eat?" They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it before them. It's a fascinating scene, really. If you think about what's happening in this moment, Jesus appears to the eleven just as they're hearing the story of Cleopas. They're still in that excited moment of the testimony. So he's apparently left them in the moment at the meal, waited till they reached this place, and then reappeared. Now, in this moment, we get to observe the reaction. And this is such a fascinating study because I think it's easy to give a lot of credit to the men that he selected as apostles before it's due. Because he didn't collect them and assign them and select them on the basis of their merits, remember? And he doesn't say that you came to me first, does he? He says... I am, am I not the one who selected you? So don't get ahead of us here. Don't get ahead of yourself in understanding who these men were and what was in their hearts. Looking at this scene, do they run to embrace Jesus? On the basis of the testimony of the women and of Cleopas, they see Him standing there. Don't they run to Him and say, finally, He's appeared to us as well? No. Jesus says, why are you so troubled? And He says, you've got doubts in your hearts. You don't trust what you're seeing. You don't know if this is real or not. You don't know whether to accept it. You're not sure what you're watching, much less willing to embrace me as the Messiah, as who I am, as real flesh and blood. He says, look at my hands. Look at my feet, which is telling because what he's saying is, I'm not some aspiration because I'm flesh and bone. That tells us that his physical resurrected body is no less dense and physical than yours and mine is today. It is not an aspiration. It is a true physical body of blood and flesh and bone. Living again. Secondly, it tells us that I'm not an imposter. I'm not someone who's come in pretending to be Jesus resurrected. Because look, no one walks around with the holes in their hands and the holes in their feet of a risen Lord out of having died on the cross. So I satisfy both the concern that I'm only spirit. That's what Doicism said in the early t days of the church. Jesus was never flesh. He was just an aspiration. He was just a, a, a vision, a all spirit being. He never really had flesh. That was a denial of the reality of God having flesh. And neither am I an imposter, because you can see the holes in my hands. And they're still, we're told, not believing in Him. Look at verse 41 for that confirmation. They do not believe in Him. What does belief mean? I mean, if you think about it, do they not believe that, he's, that there's something before them? No, oh, no, I'm sure they would say, yeah, there's something there. They don't believe that maybe it's Jesus? I don't know if that's not true. Maybe they know it's Him in some sense. What do they not believe? They do not believe that God has been resurrected from the dead. That this is a man who once was dead and now is alive. Pure and simple. And to that he says, well, you have any food around here? And I have another view of this scene that I think adds, again, a sense of, of comic relief here. He takes a bite of this food and he begins to eat the broiled fish, which is obviously staged as proof that I am real, obviously. But do you see him kind of chewing the food with a big smile on his face as he looks at them? Kind of having a little fun in the moment that, hey, I'm eating. What do you think of this? Kind of, I, I, maybe I'm overstating it, but I see that in the moment. Do you need any more proof than this moment of the truth of the story of Lazarus and the rich man? Here are 11 disciples inspecting, physically inspecting Jesus' own resurrected body. And yet, that resurrection 
does not bring them to the belief that He is who He said He is. It's a living example of the story of Lazarus and the rich man. This is exactly what would have happened if Lazarus had been resurrected, sent back to the brothers, appeared in their home, and those brothers stood around and inspected Lazarus physically. They would never have believed, therefore, that God is God and that the Scriptures are true and that they must accept a Messiah. None of that would have been the result of that kind of an experience because it didn't happen for the disciples. I would argue that if it doesn't happen for them, it's not going to happen for you, I, or anyone else because it can't. Nothing can bring faith in the heart of a man except the Word of God preached. And in one final confirmation of that truth, look at how Luke's Gospel ends tonight. Luke 24, 44. Now He said to them, These are My words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Mark, by the way, as I interrupt this for a moment, Mark, by the way, as he describes this scene, says that Jesus admonished them at this point. Basically, He's mad or He's angry or at the very least, He gives them a very strong rebuke. The smile is gone. This is now a statement of rebuke. And he says, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of My Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And He led them out as far as Bethany. And He lifted up His hands and blessed them. While He was blessing them, He parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping Him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Once again, Jesus begins with His words and the words of the Old Testament Scriptures as the basis from which a faith can blossom. An understanding, in other words, could come to them about who they were looking at. And with that explanation from the Word of God, we're told in verse 45, their minds are opened and they believed in their risen Lord. Whatever belief they had about who Jesus was prior to this moment, prior to the resurrection and until they this moment came when they got the Word of God explained to them as, it, as God intended it to be. Until this moment, whatever they may have thought of who He was, it was not the same thing as understanding Him as their Messiah. And I believe the Scriptures reinforce this in another interesting way. We're told earlier as we studied in this same text that Jesus was uh, said to have appeared to them and to Simon. If you look back in verse 34, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. That's Simon Peter. But none of them described the moment, which suggests it was a private moment. That at some point along the way, Peter got his own audience with the risen Lord. Now, what explains Jesus coming to Peter apart from the rest of the, of the apostles in some special way? The only conclusion I can draw is it's connected to the fact that Peter alone in the earlier verses of the Gospels acknowledged Jesus as Lord when he says in Matthew 16 that that famous confession upon which Jesus says he will build the church. Peter, it seems, is the only... And remember Jesus' response when Peter has that comment. He says, You are blessed, Simon Peter, because flesh and bone did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed it to you. Suggesting yet again that the, the knowledge of who God is rests in the sovereign responsibility of the Lord Himself to bring that knowledge to the heart of a man. And his confession of who Jesus was was proof that God had done a work in his heart to give him that knowledge. It doesn't necessarily suggest that that work was done beyond Peter in that moment. And what I would conclude from the end of chapter 24 is it never did. That it's in this moment at the end when the rest become knowledgeable as to who Jesus was and are ready now to follow Him in faith. This could explain, for example, why the early church and generations that followed saw Peter in that early role of a leader because it's clear enough that the that Jesus Himself tended to favor Peter from the standpoint of giving him early insight, ultimately a leadership role in the church. This is all consistent with what we see here happening at the end of chapter 24. Finally, we're told Jesus gives His his departing instructions to His disciples. He commands them, remain in the city until they receive power from on high. The time we know that represents the Holy Spirit's arrival to the early church at an age when the men of the church and the women of the church will now be empowered for ministry, which is a promise you and I share today. And then He leads them outside the city to a place 
where Jesus returns to the Father, leaving them as we hear to return into the city and worship Him joyfully in the temple. This is the, the departing scene that reminds me of a movie. That as it ends, you're left wondering, I wonder what part two will bring us next summer. Well, in the meantime, we live a life called to disciple and to teach others to obey. Principally, it's not about making believers, for we don't have the power to do so. It is rather a ministry of being true to the confession of our faith and of a witness to the truth of the gospel, such that God may choose to work through us to bring believers. And then as they are made, we disciple them. We mature, we, we mature them as others have worked to mature us. And his departing comments and instructions to the disciples were to be prepared for that ministry, to recognize its arrival through the Holy Spirit, and to respond. My challenge as we end the study, as we end our time in Luke, is this. Same challenge you've heard me say before. There's no difference between the disciples and us. Not fundamentally. You and I have come to faith by the same means. We've been empowered by the same Holy Spirit. We've been told to wait for the same return of our Lord. We've been given the same standards of expectations. We've been told the same rules apply for the judgment seat of Christ as He evaluates the effect of our ministry and the faithfulness with what we've been given to do. We have the same lost and dying world. We have all the same things. The only thing that's different between them and us is the date on the calendar. And that hardly matters to a a God who has assigned us a time and a place to do ministry and is prepared to work through us. So the challenge is, are we going to respond in the way the apostles did to the command they were given? Or will we be the kind that returned to the life that existed before they met Christ? To the days of fishing and tax collecting where the old life came back. I hope we don't do that. I hope none of us would do that. As we know God from our faith and our study of Scripture, but maybe even more now from our study in Luke, there'd be a a command on our hearts to do something with what we've heard. Whatever He leads us to do, certainly, but do accordingly. I praise You and thank You as well for the time and the patience You've given me as I've studied. No teacher ever teaches without learning more than the students, and that's been the case for me as well. And I uh, look forward to going back into the Word with you in a few weeks in the book of Jonah. Dear Heavenly Father, We praise You. We thank You. We give You all the glory for our study of Luke. From the very first day, two years ago, until tonight, Your faithfulness, Father, has never wavered. The the Word, Father, has never failed us and failed to enlighten us, Father. The Holy Spirit has been so true to teach and convict and guide us in all that we've done. Father, so much of this process has been Yours to do and Your faithfulness to depend on. What is there for us, Father, but obedience? We do not have to explain, Father, what You've taught. We do not have to uh, make excuses, Father, for what we may have known before we were enlightened. We, we, We do not have to worry, Father, about making up for our past mistakes. Father, all that we know is Christ and Him crucified and the life set before us to obey. And Father, may we have the courage and the desire to do so. To obey, first, Father, in a life that reflects all that we've learned in the example Christ gave. And then, secondly, Father, a life that is set upon Your Word, the truth of it, Father, the power of it. And secondly, Father, on the power of the Holy Spirit in us to guide us into a complete knowledge of all that You would have for us. Just a dependence on Him and all that we do. I pray for that. A last thanks, Father, for this provision of a building and for all the things that have gone into making this study possible. We just give you the glory for that. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to attend. May we go out from here a new person in all that we've learned, and may we come back in your timing to study your word again. In Jesus' name, amen.